morning. Excited to, uh, excited to be here, glad to be in church, glad to see you guys. Uh, it's, it's been a good day already, I'm trusting uh, that we'll just continue that with round two here in second service. This is always the crowd that's a little more awake because they slept in and they had a few cups of coffee on the way, so just got to swing through and get something. So is everybody awake this morning? Everybody doing good? Awesome, good, that's good news. Uh, I'm, excited to, uh, I'm excited to continue in our series, Storytellers. Before I jump in, though, I want to say that it's really cool. This is kind of a, a strange thing that doesn't get to happen very often, uh, but I've got my mom here this morning, and so mama's here, all right? So that's kind of cool for me. Mom and, dad are, mom and dad are pastors, and so they're normally, they're normally in their own service, but mom's visiting, hanging out, and uh, so that's kind of cool for me. So uh, welcome, mama. Good to have you in church. Hope you get saved today. That'd be cool. <laughs> Just kidding. My mom loves Jesus. She's the reason I love Jesus. So um, I'm excited to jump into this series, uh, Storytellers. Uh, we've been doing it over the last few weeks, and Pastor Darren has uh, really tackled some of the heroes of the Bible. Uh, if you grew up in church like I did, uh, you, these are the people that you probably had on the flannel graphs. Anybody remember flannel graphs? Right? Uh, Peter, James, and John all looked the same because we only had one guy that we put on the flannel graph, you know, we, uh, the lame guy, we ripped his legs off when Jesus healed him, we put him back on there, right? That's how, we were on a small church budget when I was growing up, so that's how it worked for us. But uh, man, we talked, about, uh, we talked about Noah and the ark, we talked about David and Goliath, we talked about Daniel and the lion's den, and uh, just some of the prominent, like powerful stories and the heroes of the Bible throughout the course of this Storyteller series. And so uh, today I'm going to tackle a little bit less known, uh, maybe, maybe not quite front center stage person in the Bible, but nonetheless one of my favorite personal stories in the Bible. Uh, but before we jump into it, I want to tell you a quick story. In 1936, King Edward VIII uh, was getting ready to give a speech, and uh, it was going to be broadcasted throughout England and also around the world to the United States. And uh, just minutes before the speech began, someone in the radio station that was broadcasting uh, tripped over a wire that, that literally connected the transmission to the radio so that the message could be broadcasted. And so it pulled it out and it broke, and uh, they had just a couple of minutes to try to figure out how they're going to reconnect this and get it working before the king began to, uh, to speak. And uh, a quick-thinking technician uh, just seconds before, grabbed the bare wire with one hand and the bare radio wire with the other one, and literally his body completed the circuit. And so the message flowed through the wire, through him into the radio, and broadcasted to the world. He just sat there and held it through the duration of the speech. And so um, I'll tell you that story to tell you that uh, that is a little bit how the, uh, the prophets in the Old Testament worked. Uh, God was uh, speaking to the people, but there was a disconnect because God is holy and the people were sinful. And so uh, in order for them to have relationship with God or in order for them to get messages from God, he would choose men like the prophets and he would speak to them and literally their lives would be the thing that, that uh, transmitted the message from heaven to earth. And uh, in the Old Testament, we have two uh, kind of sections when we talk about Old Testament prophets. We have the major prophets and we have the minor prophets. And this is not like baseball where you have major league and minor league. And uh, maybe the prophets weren't that good, so they sent them down to the minors for a little bit, you know, to get some reps. That's not how this was. Um, actually, uh, the minor prophets might have been considered better because... The only reason they were minor is because their books were shorter, their sermons were shorter, okay? So people liked them more because they didn't preach as long uh, like uh, Isaiah. But uh, no, we're going to, so the minor prophets are just considered minor because their books are, and their messages were a little bit shorter. And uh, we're going to look at one of the minor prophets today. We're going to look at the book of Hosea. And Hosea was a prophet during, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of history and background here uh, as we kind of get started because it's important to understand the context of, of what was happening and really get the message. Um, so Hosea was the prophet during King Jeroboam II's reign. And uh, he was the king in Israel. And uh, Israel at this point was divided. There was a northern kingdom, Israel, and there was a southern kingdom, Judah. And uh, he was the king of the northern kingdom. And uh, Jeroboam II was an evil king. 
Uh, the Bible said he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He encouraged idolatry. Um, he, was, he had blended a lot of things in with uh, God. And so there was, a, there was a lot of things going on in the world at that time that really displeased the Lord. Uh, one of those things is that King Jeroboam II really uh, took confidence in his political alliances. Uh, he, he decided that instead of just being on an island there in Israel, that he would unite himself with some of the neighboring nations. So, so he made deals and alliances with the Assyrians and, and with Egypt so that, uh, so that he had some military strength and, and protection and promises of wealth and things like that. He, he increased the commerce. Uh, what he didn't know is that eventually his alliance with Assyria would actually lead to the overthrow of the nation of Israel uh, because Assyria would eventually come in and take Israel into captivity and exile. Um, and so, but, but King Jeroboam II really had a lot of trust in that. In fact, he trusted in that more than he did God. Uh, up to this point, the nation of Israel had been completely provided for and protected by God. They, brought, they were brought out of the land of Egypt they were brought across the wilderness and into the promised land, um, and, and God had done all those things. He had provided manna for them to eat. He had parted the Red Sea. He made it to where their shoes and clothes didn't wear out for 40 years in the wilderness. God had been the provision. God had been the protection. God had been the sustenance and everything that they needed, and yet Jeroboam II's trust was not in God, but rather it was in himself and in, in uh, the politics and the leaders that he brought alongside of him in the military and things like that. Um, so with the infiltration and with the, the partnerships of these other kingdoms um, also came the beliefs and the practices of these other kingdoms. Uh, they brought with them their gods from their lands. And uh, we began to see some, some merging that, that would happen. And their primary god was the god of Baal. Baal was a fertility god. He was believed that Baal was what made your crops fertile and, and, and produced. It was believed that Baal was the God that would make sure your livestock produced and, and that even your families grew. And because God, uh, Baal was a, a fertility God, much of the worship to Baal uh, included th all kinds of manners of sexual sin and, and uh, even killing and sacrificing babies uh, in worship to this false God. Um, the, the Kind of the unfortunate and crazy thing about it is that during this time, uh, when Jeroboam II was in reign and uh, all, of these, all of these alliances are taking place, it was actually uh, really good for the economy of Israel. There was a lot of good commerce. People were really making money and uh, they, were, they were being protected and they had kind of uh, created all of these new lines of, uh, of um, income. And so the people were wealthy and their lives were pretty comfortable. Uh, the, the, you know, the wars had kind of stopped during this time, and uh, they were, they were kind of living the cush life. They were living their life, and they were, they were pretty happy. But in that, uh, their confidence uh, had begun to shift into Jeroboam and to, oh, look what he's done for us, and look at, the, look at how safe everything is, and look how good life is going. And so uh, they, they actually became very comfortable, and they looked at the gods of Baal, and they go, this Baal god must be working. Uh, you know, the worship of him and, and how everybody's worshiping and, and all of these things. Maybe he is a God too. So literally in the most holy places where only worship to the living God, Yahweh, should happen, they were putting idols of Baal and some of the other idols in those places. And in the same breath that they are worshiping Yahweh, they were also, be, also worshiping Baal. Now, as believers and people of faith that know God's word, we know that this is not how God intended life to be for his people. We understand that, that God said, I am God, beside me there is no other. We understand that in the Ten Commandments that he says that we're not to worship any other gods before him. And so as you can imagine, uh, this displeased the Lord and he was very frustrated with the nation of Israel for the place that they had allowed themselves to get. And so he began to use the prophet Hosea to communicate a message to the people of Israel. And the message that he would have, the, uh, have Hosea transmit through his life was a painful and a stern rebuke and a call to repentance. 
The message uh, that God would have Hosea speak to the nation of Israel was one of judgment. It was one that you have stepped outside of the boundaries that we agreed on. We, you have stepped outside of the plan that I have for you. And because of that, there is judgment coming your way. They had earned it because of their actions. And there was an indictment on the way that they were living their life. And there's three primary indictments that, that Hosea makes in his message to the nation of Israel. And the first one is this. There's no knowledge of God in the land. It was an indictment on the nation of Israel. The God that brought you out and the God that provided for you, somehow throughout the years, you have walked away from him and you have slowly faded away to the point where now we have a generation that is illiterate and and, and absent of the knowledge of God. And because of that, an, an apathetic spirit had grown in the people of Israel. They, they'd become apathetic towards the Lord. They didn't, they didn't pursue Him. They didn't pursue relationship with Him. They didn't love Him and worship Him. They just thought, hey, we've kind of got a good thing going. God, cool, if you bless it, it's all right. But regardless, like, we're pretty good. And so there was, there was a lack of a knowledge of God. And because there's no knowledge, there's no intimacy with Him. The second uh, primary indictment that uh, Hosea makes on the nation of Israel is that, hey, your trust is completely in yourself. God says, I have been so faithful to you and I have been so good to you and yet you are trusting in government and you are trusting in military and you are trusting in your own self and your own ability to make uh, a living and to make families and to make yourself prosperous that you have completely forgotten who I am and all that I have done for you. And lastly, he said, you have propped these other gods and you have allowed idolatry to come and to sneak into your life. And you have allowed things to take the place of God or even just simply maybe they didn't replace God, but we simply put them alongside God and worship them in tandem with him. And God said, this is just not okay. And so to get the attention of the people of Israel, God used the life of Hosea as a, as a play, as a script, as an, a living, breathing illustration. He did it in a very unique way. Way, but he also, uh, man, I, I, I just love the story. Let's just jump right in because I don't want to give away the ending just yet if you've never heard it. Again, one of my favorites. So, this is how the story begins Hosea chapter 1, verse 2. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman. Now, I don't know about you, but this doesn't seem like the right first step if you're going to get the attention of a nation. And I can promise you today that God is not speaking to you in the same way that he was speaking to Hosea on that day. So if you hear that and you say, I think that's the voice, it's not the voice of the Lord, I promise. He said, go marry a promiscuous, I want you to go find a floozy, Hosea. Go find a prostitute, a harlot, Go find an unfaithful, floozy, wild woman of the streets. That's what I want you to do. And I want you to love her. Hosea goes to the part of town that most men of God would probably not want to be found. And he finds a woman, a beautiful woman with a horrific name. Her name was Gomer. Once again, if your name's Gomer, I do apologize this morning. I only think of Gomer Pyle. I do not think of a beautiful woman when I hear the name Gomer. In fact, if someone says, I I got this new girlfriend, her name's Gomer, I'm going, I'm sorry. (laughs) He marries Gomer. He takes this promiscuous woman into his life, into his house, and he loves her. And he marries her. And as their life begins, God literally is using his marriage Uh, and his family to paint a picture and to illustrate the message of God to the nation of Israel. So before long, Gomer is with child and gives birth to their firstborn son. And through the child's name, God sends a message to the nation of Israel. He says, name the child Jezreel. Now, the name Jezreel means to scatter or sow. See, up to this point, the promise of God is that I would plant you as a people in a place. That I'm going to give you a place and that's where you're going to live. I'm going to put you there. 
But because of their disobedience and because of the place they had allowed themselves to come, God says, no, I'm going to scatter you around the nations. The things that I once said was going to be yours and the promise that was going to be yours and the place that was going to be yours is no longer. I'm going to scatter you across the earth. See, this was a, uh, it was pointing to uh, the, the overthrow of the Assyrians that, that I mentioned earlier. Because the Assyrian nation would not come in just with brute force and military strength and, and carry people off. Rather, they would take people and then they would scatter them throughout the other nations of Assyrian rule. And when that would happen, those people would begin to intermarry with Assyrians and they would begin to infiltrate that, that, the, the people to the place where uh, eventually, after a couple of years, after a couple of generations, the people forgot where it was they came from and to whom they belonged. So the Assyrian uh, strategy for conquering was one that they would come in, they would scatter, and they would cause you to lose your identity. They did it through the guise of freedom. Making you think that you were free to live in these places, free to make choices, free to build a life in these areas, but actually they were causing you, causing the people of Israel to assimilate into their culture and into their practices. See, I would say this morning that it is most often captivity disguised as freedom that holds the most destructive power in the life of the believer. We often talk about the freedom, that how we are free in Christ and we are free to live and we love the fact that we live in a free country and so we're free to make our choices and we're free to live our lives and we're free to run our families and our finances and our, and, and our ideas and our perspectives. But most often what happens is that in that freedom, the enemy will find a way to sneak in. And he will find a way to begin to blend our ideas and to blend our thoughts and to blend our thinking with that of a world that we do not belong to. And it, the seemingly innocent compromises uh, for the sake of social relevancy begin to wear away on the commitments and the, and the, and the faith that we have in God. It is the slow moral fade, it is the slow transfer of trust to a system or to an individual or to a power. It is the gradual undermining of the validity and the efficacy of the Word of God. It is the slow washout that happens over time that scatters those who believe and creates distance between those of like faith. These are the tactics of the Assyrians, and I would, I would dare to say this morning that that Assyrian work is still at work in our world. That same strategy is being used by the enemy today and that I believe that's why the, the, the Apostle Paul would say, don't neglect gathering together. Don't neglect staying together because once you get scattered, once you are scattered, you begin to assimilate with the people that you are around. And what was once a, 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 a unified people with a strong connection to each other and a strong connection to God and a strong conviction in the faith will evolve into a deluded people that are separated from each other, separated from God, separated from the truths of His Word, and have begun to accept social norms. The enemy infiltrates our lives and scatters to the place where we forget who we are and to whom we belong. It was the first child that Jose had. It wasn't long after that that they bore a daughter. The second born child of Jose and Gomer. And they named her, once again at the instruction of God, Lo Ruhama, which means no mercy, no love, no love. What he was saying through the name of this child is he was telling the nation of Israel, up to this point, I have been a mercy covering for you. To this point, I have protected you, and I have provided for you, and I have loved you, and I have been there for you, but you have continually walked away from me, and I am fed up. There is no more mercy, no more love. 
With every call of this child's name, Hosea was reminded of the impending judgment that was coming on the nation of Israel because they had walked out from under the mercy covering of a loving God. Because they had willing, des- willingly decided to live a life that was in stark contrast of the one that God had designed them for. It was a reminder of the covenants that they had broken that were written in the book of Deuteronomy. The if and then statements. If God was saying, if you will, then I will. And because the people of Israel hadn't held up their end of the bargain, they didn't get the promise that comes with the premise. And so he said, no mercy, no love. They were going to experience the wages of their sin. They were going to feel the penalty for choosing other gods. They were going to have to live with the results of their actions and their choices. Not long after that, once again, Gomer conceived and bore a third son. And they named him Lo-Ami, which means not mine. It could be the name of the child actually reflected the truth about Gomer's infidelity. That when Hosea looked at the child, he knew at that moment that was not his child. He knew at that moment that the promiscuous woman that he had married had once again walked into the arms of another man and had conceived a child and that he looked at it and he said, I'm sorry, but I don't see how this could possibly be mine. Lo of me, not mine. The characteristics of the father were not in the child. And now she had given birth to the proof of her promiscuity and infidelity to Hosea. And with this child and with this name, God was speaking to the nation of Israel. Up to this point, I have said, you uh, will be my children and I will be your father. Up to this point, he said, you are mine, and I have, you are created in my image. But when I look at you right now, I don't see anything of me in you. When I look at you, Israel, I don't see myself in you. I don't see my character in you. I don't see my love in you. I don't see my faithfulness in you. I look at you, and I say, there's no way those are my kids. You've given yourself to other gods. You've followed other cultures. You don't look like me anymore. I'm not claiming you. I'm disowning you. You are not mine. And so every time that uh, that little boy was running around and Hosea said, Lo of me, come here. What he was saying is, you are an indictment on the nation of Israel. It was a reminder of the hurt and the, and the pain and, the, and the, the heartbreak that comes with the infidelity of his own wife loving other men and, nat- uh, and, and the nation of Israel loving other gods. One morning, Hosea wakes up. And he rolls over and Gomer's not there. Goes to the other area of the houses looking for her. Goes outside looking for her. She's nowhere to be found. He knows in his heart where exactly that she is. She has decided once again to return to a life of harlotry and prostitution. She has returned to the passions of her flesh and to the arms of strange lovers. And he is left broken, hurting with the three children that they had created, he's left there caring for them. He had loved her, even though she was hard to love. He struggled with her, knowing her tendency and proclivity toward the lust of her past. He had children with her, maybe even hoping that this would keep her faithful to him. As he cares for his three kids, I'm sure he couldn't help but think about the fact that his wife was in the arms of another man somewhere across town. In fact, he went into those areas of town and he looked for her and found her and tried to, but tried to beg her and plead her to come on back. She continued to chase after those other men, that other life. She thought she was being provided for by her lovers, but instead it was actually Hosea that was giving things to her lovers to care for her. Which only emboldened her actions and made her think, this is good, I am living here, everything is fine. Secretly, he was the one providing. We look at this situation and it appears to be hopeless. God had 
pronounced judgment on the nation of Israel. And he had, he had come to the place where he would, had decided they were going to pay for their actions. He said, I'm going to scatter you. I'm not going to show you any mercy or any love. I'm going to abandon you as my children. And then suddenly there's a change in the narrative of this story. As God begins to reveal his character towards us. There's a word in scripture that I really like. It says, yet. See, up to this point, they had earned the judgment. They had, they had lived in a way that decided that God's judgment would come. Yet. It says in verse 19, it says, yet I will betroth you to me forever. What? What? After the way that they've lived, after the way that they've walked away, I will love you again. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness and you will acknowledge the Lord. Aren't you glad that somewhere in your life, when you deserved judgment, when you deserved mercy to be gone, and you deserved to be scattered, and you deserved not to be called a child of God, that there was a but God moment in your life. Aren't you glad that when you were in a hopeless situation and you had made a mess of your life, there was the story of your life was being written and it looked like all hope was gone but God. Am I the only one that has experienced a but God moment? Come on, there were moments in my life where I looked, the doctor's report wasn't good, but God. I was broken in my marriage. I didn't know if we were going to make it, but God. I had made a mess of my life. I didn't have the answers. I was empty and longing, but God. God. Over and over throughout Scripture, we see how when God walks into the scene, no matter how hopeless or how empty or how deserving it may be, His love and His kindness and His mercy and His grace have a way of shifting the narrative. Ephesians chapter 2 says this. It says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the heart of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and the inclinations of our own sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead in our sins he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead and it is only by God's grace that you have been saved aren't you thankful for that today but God but God, if you read the book of Hosea and it begins to show the indictments that I'm going to scatter you and there's no mercy for you and you're not mine. He said, and yet I will plant you in my place. And yet I will show mercy and love to you. And yet in the very place that I said you are not mine, I will once again say that you are my sons and you are my daughters. That's the love and the mercy of Jesus Christ. That's his character towards us. Romans 5, 8 says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. But God. And he says, you want to know why I'm doing this? You want to know why I'm betrothing you to myself? Not because of anything that you've done. Not because you deserve it. Not because you're good enough for it. Not because you've earned it. But because of my righteousness. And because of my judgment. And because of my faithfulness. And because of my mercy. Because this is my character. I will withhold judgment. And I will. But God. I will end yet. And I will betroth you to myself. Why? Verse 20 says. And you will acknowledge. So that you will acknowledge the Lord. 
The word acknowledge there is the word yada, which means to experience through relationship. It's an intimate word. In the same way that a man and a wife know each other, uh, God is saying, I want to know you intimately. I want to walk with you. I'm not calling you and beckoning you into a relationship where I can domineer you. I'm, I'm beckoning you into a familial relationship where I can be a father to you and we can walk together and I can love you and know you and you me. He says, I want you to know me. Why? Because to know God is to love God. When you know him, you will love him. And to illustrate this love and this grace and this mercy, God was feeling towards the nation of Israel in spite of their walking away. God twists the narrative in Hosea's life and he does it in one of the most unthinkable ways possible. In Hosea chapter 3, it says, Then the Lord said to me, Go and love your wife again. What? She's left me here with these three kids. She's somewhere across town with who knows who, doing who knows what, I tried this before, God. You sent me, and I said yes, and I took her, and it was against my my best uh, knowledge and understanding. It was against everything that I believed, and I did it anyway. And I was played a fool for it. She did me wrong. She doesn't deserve me. I was faithful to her, and I was good to her, and she walked away anyway. And God said, Hosea, Go find her. Go find her. Go find your wife. Love her again. Even though she commits adultery with another lover. Look what he says. This will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel. Even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them. See, at this point in Gomer's life, she had hit rock bottom. She had pursued the passions of her flesh. She had went across town. She had lived her life. But at this point, she was used and abused, and she was broken and empty. She had been passed around, she, but she had found herself in a place where there was no hope. No one wanted her anymore. No one loved her And Hosea, being obedient to God, went back to that disgusting part of town. A place that a man of God probably shouldn't be. With people that the man of God probably shouldn't be around. And he's asking them. I could see his face turn blood red. I said, yeah, I'm sorry. have you seen my wife? looking for Gomer. See, have, you, have you seen my wife? He said, I, she was with so-and-so, man. Like, this is kind of awkward, but man, I don't know where she's at. She's been around, but I haven't seen her lately. He scours the dirty streets, the wrong part of town in the red light district, asking, have you seen Have you seen Gomer? If you see her, can you tell her I'm looking for her? I still love her. I'm looking for her. She's mine. They said, wait, I think I saw her just around the corner, but you're not going to like where she's at, Hosea. I'm not sure you want to go there. He said, tell me where she is. And he walks up, and he finds Gomer in the middle of an auction for sex slaves. And she's standing on the auction block, her eyes hollow, her face downcast, shoulder slumped, she's beaten, she's abused, she's humiliated. No one wants her, the gavel falls, they said, who will start the bidding? The room falls silent. 
And all of a sudden, from the back of the room, a familiar voice. As Hosea speaks up and he says, I'll take her. I'll buy her. Name your price. She's mine. Gomer collapses into a puddle of tears. It's the voice of her husband, Hosea, says, I'll, I'll want her. He walks up to her and he gets down on his knees in that moment. And in the middle of a sex slave auction, Hosea renews his marital vows to Gomer. He says, I'm going to love you. I'm going to be yours and you're going to be mine. And then he begins to prophesy to the nation of Israel as everyone looks on as his life is the living illustration of this moment and of the feelings in the heart of God. He begins to prophesy and he begins to tell about a king that is coming through the lineage of David. He begins to tell about a king that will return and will come for Israel even though they have walked away from him. He begins to tell about his loving kindness and his mercy and his love and that he will come and in the same way that Hosea is purchasing Gomer back to himself that this king will redeem the people of Israel back to himself. The king that he was talking about was Jesus Christ because you and I were Gomer and you and I were standing on the auction block of this life and we were broken and we were empty and we were worthless and we didn't deserve it but he walked into the room and he stood at the back and he said I'll pay the highest price for them I still love them I still want them they are mine I want them that's my people understand today that in those times uh, before a husband could marry a bride he had to pay a dowry for her Hosea had already paid a price to to have Gomer be by his side he had already paid a price but he came in and he paid it again he paid the price for her I can't help but think about the fact that Psalms 24 says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof I can't help but think about 1 Corinthians where it says that you are not your own but you were bought with a price Christ. You are already God's. You are already His kids. He created you. He knit you together. He formed you in your mother's womb. And yet, He was willing to walk in the disgusting places of your life, in the shameful places of your life, and pay the highest price for you because He loves you so much. John 3 16 says, For God so loved the world. He so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not have to perish but would have eternal life. Look what it says. It said God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might saved Hosea didn't walk into that auction and wag his finger in the face of Gomer and say you worthless disrespectful unfaithful no he walked in and he said I love you so much there's nothing I wouldn't pay to redeem you to myself there's nothing I wouldn't do to have you come back home to me Jesus was not sent to the world to wag a finger in your face and to tell you how worthless you are. He came as an expression of the love of a God that desperately wants relationship with you. He sent Jesus to stand between heaven and earth in the auction room of your life to buy you back with his own life's blood to renew his vows and his commitment to you and you to him
As Hosea's very short book concludes in chapter 14, this is what he says. After all of this, he says, return to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Take words with you. He said, go talk to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all of our sins and receive us graciously. That we may offer the fruit of our lips. That we may prove with our lives that what we're saying is that we are committed. Verse 3. Assyria cannot save us. God, our trust is in no one else. We'll not mount war horses. God, we know that, that you are everything we need. We'll never again say our gods to things that our own hands have made. For in you, the fatherless, find compassion. As Hosea is writing this book and, and, and proclaiming the story of his life, he's saying, look, God's biggest request is that you would just return to him. He's done everything he can to come to you. Will you simply come home with him? Stand to your feet all across the room today. He closes with this in verse 9 of chapter 14. He says, who is wise? Let them realize these things. Who is discerning? Let them understand. The ways of the Lord are right. And the righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. I ask you today, in this moment, to be wise. Be wise. Don't be rebellious and continue to stumble through life looking for things of this world to fill the, the needs and the longing for relationship that you have that can only be found in relationship with a loving Father. Be wise. Return your heads bowed and your eyes closed for just a second. I ask you this. Are you like me? Are you Gomer? Have you found yourself in a place you never thought you'd find yourself? Have you found yourself standing today empty and broken? good news Jesus is here and he's here not to scold you not to condemn you but to love you when you deserve judgment when you don't deserve mercy when you don't deserve to be called his children that's when he shows up and he says, they're mine. I want them. Nobody else may want them. Nobody else may think anything about them. I love them. Right where you are. You don't have to do anything to earn it. You can't. You don't have, there's no prerequisites. There's no cleaning yourself up. There's no making some changes before you can come. Right there, empty, broken, used, and abused on the auction block of this life. He has already said, I'll pay the highest price for them. Right there in the state they're in. That's where I want them. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Chad, I'm ready to renew my commitment, my vows to the Lord. Maybe for the first time. Maybe for the first time in a long time. Say, Pastor Chad, I feel that love of Jesus. And even though I don't feel that I deserve it, I am ready to accept it. Will you slip your hands up to say, that's me. That's me. I'm ready to recommit. I'm ready to say yes to the Lord. I'm ready to walk away from this lifestyle that I've been living, the emptiness that it brings, and to walk into relationship with a loving God. Hands are up all over the building. Come on, if that's you, slip your hand up. It's okay. It's just me, you, and Jesus today. I just want to pray for you. Everyone in the room, there are hands all across the building. Everyone in the room, I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. Let's pray this together as a family of faith, as a church. Father God, 
I've walked away. I'm a sinner. I'm broken. I'm empty. And I'm in need. I don't deserve your love. I deserve your judgment. But I'm asking you today to forgive my sin, to take me back, and to make me yours. I commit my life to you, Jesus. Thank you for paying the highest price for me. I want to walk in relationship with you. In Jesus' name. Thank you.